Okay. Thank you, Ryan, uh, for joining me here today on Vonvo.com to uh, discuss the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's a pleasure having you on to hear your opinion about this subject. Um, and I definitely want to jump right into the discussion. Uh, perhaps there will be someone else who joins. If we have someone else who joins, Ryan, um, you know, who might have a different viewpoint than yourself, you know, just to be clear, we're trying to keep, you know, these discussions very civil and, um, you know, make them as valuable as possible. Um, and maybe we have someone joining us right here. So hold on. And I can, so I don't have to repeat myself. Robbie, are you there? Do you hear him, Ryan, or no? I can't hear him at all. Robbie, are you there? Robbie, are you there? Do you hear me? Can you hear me now? We hear you vaguely. Um, your internet connection might be a little laggy. Do you hear us? Okay, yeah, just just leave and come back if you want, Robbie, okay? Okay, great. Okay, just click exit Vonvo. Um, so, Ryan, just basically, we'll try keeping the conversation, you know, uh, as friendly as possible, no personal attacks on anyone, um, and, you know, past that, yeah. those are really the only ground rules. Um, obviously, we want to hear everyone's opinion on this subject, so um, that's really, you know, all I have to address from there. So, just to get started, um, would you mind giving um, the, you know, giving everyone who's listening right now uh, an introduction, you know, about yourself, your background, um, you know, where you're from, etc. Sure. Uh, I'm Métis. That means that I'm uh, Aboriginal Canadian. I'm from Northern Canada. Uh, a place called, it's a Métis settlement, which is kind of like an Indian reserve. Uh, Ryan, are you hearing an echo? Yeah, it's weird. I'm, I'm, it's like a delay lag. I think it's R Robbie... If you can click exit Vonvo, that's the reason for it. Um, if Robbie can click exit Vonvo, that would probably clear that up. There we go. Do you hear me better now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, great. So go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm Métis. I got involved being an Israeli advocate probably about 15, 16 years ago while I was in university. Great. Uh, I don't know. I don't really have a. I'm not. I'm, I'm a strong believer in, in Israel, but I don't. I'm not one of those people that thinks Israel is perfect by any stretch. Right. Okay. And what was? What exactly? What exactly? Um, was there any particular moment or um, sort of occurrence that got you, you know, very passionate about this subject that you want to, you know, let people know about? How did you become so passionate about Israel and Palestine? Well, when I was younger. Uh, my dad, when I was a kid, my dad gave me a book. It was pretty interesting. Uh, I noticed here Greta decided to come in and ask me if I'm selling munitions. I think that's kind of funny. Uh, but anyways, uh, my dad gave me a book about Jonathan Net Netanyahu when I was younger. Uh, I read the book and never really paid much attention. But when I was in university, I watched this apartheid wall. Uh, and uh, I got in a little bit of trouble because I walked over and asked them exactly what they meant by an apartheid wall. And none of them could really explain it to me. So I kind of got a little bit irritated with them. And I said, well, if Israel is apartheid, uh, how come they have Arab Israeli members of Knesset? So right. there's, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of little things that kind of slowly built up. And then finally I got to the point where I realized that most of the people that are pro-Palestinian are not really pro-Palestinian. They're more anti-Israeli, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Now, do you necessarily, does that, you don't necessarily think that applies to all people. You just think that there's a select. I don't think it applies to all of them, but I mean, there's a very strong, uh, there's a very strong anti-Semitic base to the anti-Israeli lobby, and you really see it when they start talking about Zionists. When they throw out the word Zionist to to replace the word Jew, and then they, you know that they're talking about Jews. It's actually kind of humorous. Right, and so I mean, you know, you're kind of bringing up some interesting subjects. Um, I know I sent you a Facebook message the other day telling you what some of the subjects were that we were going to try and cover. 
Um, so, I mean, just because you bring it up and, you know, it cannot kind of all relate to the idea behind uh, the subject of if Israel is an apartheid state, you bring up the idea behind Zionists. And we just had a conversation before, excuse me, earlier in the morning, uh, we had an Israeli and uh, a Palestinian, and they were discussing the idea behind uh, Zionists. And, you know, there are certain levels of Zionism, it seems. Uh, what's your take on that situation? Because, you know, one of the Israelis uh, we had, you know, considers himself a Zionist, but yet, you know, has no problem at all and would love to see Palestinians and Israelis living amongst each other, uh, you know, uh, you know, and well standing. Well, absolutely. Go ahead. See, yeah, I, th I think a lot of the problem is that a lot of these people, they tend to use Zionist as a dirty word, where those of us that actually self-identify as Zionists, we don't think well, not all of us anyway, the, the non-extremists. I mean, you're going to have extremists with any group. But a non-extremist Zionist actually just believes Israel deserves to, and that it should exist in Israel. So I would have no problem with Palestinians that want it to be Israeli, living in Israel, and have pretty much everything that Israelis have. That's uh, I think that's the goal we should be working towards. Right. Okay. Um, so that's very interesting. Um so ultimately, uh, you know, that, that's your stance on that. So going into some of, you know, the more um, specific issues, um, you know, relating to the claim from pro-Palestinian individuals that Israel is a, uh, you know, a apartheid state. Um, you know, do you believe in that notion um, currently with, you know... I think it's ridiculous. Okay, and can you elaborate on I, that? I, I think it's, well, it's patently ridiculous. I mean, if you take a look at Israel itself, Israel is not Zionist. Sorry, not Zionist. Not apartheid. Apartheid means that you basically subjugate people in their race. I, I, I would challenge them and I would ask them, well, how can there be an, Isra uh, an Arab-Israeli uh, Supreme Court judge? When you see an actual apartheid, maybe they should talk to the actual South Africans. I mean, I think it's kind of humorous. They always bring up, you know, Nelson Mandela and all this other stuff. I think it's really humorous when you look at the fact that why don't they ask them, so if Israel is apartheid, then why does Israel actually have an Arab Israeli as Miss Israel? You would never have seen that in South Africa. Can you imagine a black Miss South Africa in the middle of the 1980s? I know I couldn't. No, so, you, so you're bringing up some... I mean, some right, it, so, just, it strikes me as just a little bit ridiculous. Right, so, so basically you're saying that there are a handful of you know examples... Uh, that, you know, at least don't, you know, justify the claim that it's an apartheid state. Would you agree? Would you, do you think that they, you said that, you know, you don't necessarily think Israel is uh, by any means perfect. So do you think that, you know, for example, the individual who we had on, er the individual we had on earlier um, from the West Bank, you know, he was talking about how, you know, just being able to travel freely throughout the country is a daily struggle and, because of it, he's yet to been to Jerusalem in over 11 years. Um, do you think that's where the system in Israel is by no means perfect? Well, yeah, there, there's definitely some things. Like when you look, uh, it's unfortunate, but at the genesis of nations, you'll always see violence. It's an unfortunate part of the condition of humankind. But what I tend to look at is that people will, will say things about Israel and then ignore the stuff like their neighbors. Like, if anything, you look at somewhere like Lebanon. Now, my best friend's Lebanese, but even he will say, you know, Palestinians are not treated very well in Lebanon. But we don't see, you know, free Lebanon. We don't see free the Palestinians from Lebanon. We don't ever see, you know, flotillas going to Lebanon. Yet they're treated far worse in Lebanon than they've been in Israel. What's the... Um, what's the, the Lebanese yeah, go ahead. parliament, you will never see Palestinians. Well, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so... Is there any particular reason why? Is there any particular reason why that's the case? Um, you know, and you're talking about different surrounding areas. So, what exactly is the reason why? Um, you know, Palestinians wouldn't. Uh, you know, why why they're not being treated? Um, you know, well inside of these other surrounding yeah, nations. Think, absolutely. I mean, uh, if you look historically, unfortunately for the Palestinians, their leaders were never really. Uh, never really overly concerned with the actual Palestinian people. I mean, you see people like Yasser Arafat living in fancy hotels. Meanwhile, his people are living in tents. I mean, 
it's just been when you look at the, the whole struggle, you don't see the the whole the whole situation is not very pleasant for a Palestinian person. That's the problem here. I think is that focus far too much on Israel. I, I, don't get me wrong. I mean, Israel was created from land that was originally Arab, uh, uh, but before that, it was Jewish. I mean, if you want to keep going back in history to justify these things, you can. But I mean, it's it's not going to accomplish anything. Right. Um, so ultimately, in terms of you know, it, like we, I guess you know, uh, I hear what you're saying in terms of Lebanon, but we'll focus directly on Israel and then you know what's considered yeah. the occupation of the West Bank in Gaza. Absolutely. I, yeah. So, yeah, so the reason the only reason that I was even bringing up Lebanon, to be absolutely honest, is just because it's, it's kind of the point at the hypocrisy of calling Israel an apartheid state when in actuality Israel actually does more for the Palestinians than pretty much any of the Arab countries. And that's something that get, tends to get ignored. <laughs> I was just, I was just asking, I was just asking, um, do you think that the Palestinian people right now in Gaza and the West Bank uh, are justified in their resistance movement based on how they think they're being treated? Well, like I've always said, uh, point blank, that I, I have a very hard time calling a lot of what they do as resistance. Now, if they were targeting military targets and infrastructure, I would have absolutely no qualms about it. I would say, yes, they're, they're a resistance organization, but unfortunately they tend to target civilians. And at that point, I think I think of them less as guerrillas or freedomers and more as straight out terrorists. So I don't think that they're justified in attacking uh, civilians and targeting civilians. I did notice my friend Kyle there keeps talking about Israel never targets military targets. Uh, unfortunately for the especially for people in Gaza, is that Hamas has actually openly admitted that they hide munitions depots and they hide launch sites behind civilians. Unfortunately, that's just the reality of the situation, and that's not just me talking. That's Richard Kemp, who actually was the leader of the British forces in Afghanistan, and he's actually a pretty well-known military expert. So I'm pretty sure I would take his views over somebody like Kyle. Now, do you think that the IDF is, you know, uh, you know, militarily sometimes acting, you know, wrongfully in the amount of Palestinian civilians that have been killed? I mean, do you think that there's, a, there's an argument there to be made? I think there there actually is an argument. Now, here's the thing. I mean. You can argue that sometimes the response is disproportionate, but at that point you have to ask yourself, well, if Israel decided to just start building ro random rockets and firing them into Gaza, every time Gaza fired a rocket, Israel fired one rocket back, who would suffer more? Because unfortunately, there's no bomb shelters in Gaza. There's bomb shelters in Israel and there's the Iron Dome system. So no matter what happens, when you have one side that's technologically more advanced, you're always going to see that kind of disproportionality. Right now, now I definitely agree with you, though. I mean, like, it's something to definitely look at. But I mean, then you also have to take into account if Israel was actually targeting civilians, what would the body count look like? And I mean, they they get upset when we bring this kind of fact up. But I mean, if you look at Libya or you look at Syria and you look at the numbers of casualties, just looking at it on a statistical basis, that's what it looks like when you attack civilians with military hardware. Those are the kind of casualties you'll see. Now, in, in you look at Gaza and Palestine in general, you see 50,000 casualties since 1948. So that's 50,000 people killed. That's in 60-some-odd years. Now, there, there were more people killed in Syria last year when Syria was attacking civilians. That alone says to anybody with a brain that's capable of basic math that Israel is definitely not targeting civilians. It's right. just simple math. Right. Uh, it looks like we might have someone in here. Rashid? Are you there? You don't hear him, do you, Ryan? Uh, no, I can't hear him. I don't see a picture either. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, uh, it's possible that his audio could be coming through. Um, Rashid, if you want to click exit Vonvo and then come back uh, and click start speaking, just join back up in the room. Uh, we're fine with that, uh, but we can't hear you right now. Uh, so sorry about those technical difficulties. Um, I guess what would be interesting, you know, then just to, you know, throw out there, do you think that there's any argument to be made? I see one point that Greta throws out here. Uh, do you think there's any argument or justification to be made that, you know, Israel has killed 5,000 civilians over the past 10 years and there's only been 30, you know, Israeli deaths? What are your thoughts on that? 
I think that's really simple, actually. I, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a dumb question if you ask me. You look at the the, the simple disparity in the technologies. Like, the bottom line is, if I'm six foot five and three hundred pounds, which I am, and I'm not sure how big you are, but I'm much larger than you. Obviously, I'm a pretty big fat guy. If we get in a fight and I hit you as hard as I can, it might hurt you a little bit more than if you hit me as hard as you can. Right. And unfortunately, when you're in a fight. That's the reality of the situation. People forget that these are these rocket attacks. It's kind of like if you attempt to murder me and I shoot back and kill you, am I more culpable than you are? Right. And I know they're going to try to argue that Israel hit them first, but I mean, we can go round and round about that. Got it. Once I'm just telling Rashid uh, what he could do to come back into the room and hopefully we'd hear him, and then come back okay, in no and click start. Speaking. Sure. So now, what about in the sense of, uh, let's see, in the sense of, uh, you know, the the issues regarding um, apartheid. And I hear I hear what your argument is in terms of that, um, but you know, for 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 normal uh, Palestinian individuals such as. Uh, this individual named Omar, who was on the show earlier today, or excuse me, on Vonvo. Um, you know, Omar, we, we had Omar in the room, and we had uh, an individual uh, named Rafi in the room. And Rafi is from America, um, and he lives in Jerusalem uh, now. And, you know, Omar has been in West Bank for his entire life. And, you know, Omar... Regular 25-year-old individual. He says he doesn't even affiliate himself with Hamas or the West Bank. Um, he just, oh, excuse me, Hamas or the PLO, excuse me. Um, he says he's just, you know, he's, he's neutral when it comes to the political parties. He, you know, he, he, he's upset, though, with the Israeli government where it's, you know, it, it puts a huge strain on him to live a normal life each day um, in the territory he lives in. And I wanted to get your your your... Uh, expertise on if you think the system is flawed that this is not an extremist individual this is a regular 25 year old kid um, and he yeah. is subjugated to this uh, you know abnormal way of living at least from what it sounds like and I'm going to assume he's not lying yeah no okay well assuming and I, 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 I have no doubt that he's not lying I mean the unfortunate part about a conflict of this magnitude is that you're always going to have uh, people that are easiest way to explain it is people that are going to be subjugated, unfortunately, just because of their affiliation racially or ethnically. Now, that's obviously not a good thing, and it's not right. But unfortunately, sometimes countries have to do, to, they do take their security very seriously. I mean, if you look at the United States, there's all this uh, controversy now about the TSA patting people down. But I mean, I, I would argue that maybe getting patted down is better than getting blown up. And it's unfortunate, but it, especially in the West Bank, I mean, with the level of attacks that were coming from that area, there something did have to be done, and unfortunately, civilians are the ones that end up paying for it. Right. That's on both sides. I'm sure that a lot of Israelis would like to travel there, too. Right. Uh, Rashid, are you in here now? Do you hear us? And we still don't hear you, unfortunately. Um, there's got to be something with your microphone settings, Rashid, if you hear me to why um, you're not coming in clearly right now. Um, so if you want to try and get those fixed, you can try that. Um, okay. So I'd like to ask you about another um, item relating to, you know, this whole apartheid um, item. Um, when it comes to the wall uh, that's, being built, that's been built, um, or still being built, I guess, um, you know, from all the people that I'm speaking to, uh, it's kind of like I'm. I'm kind of trying to figure out what this abstract message is that Israel, it seems, is trying to send by you know, yes, trying to um, you know defend itself, which makes sense, but then at the same time, you know, having this wall not really necessarily run along the direct border, but rather actually you know go into Palestinian lands. And then, you know, settlements be built within those lands, potentially. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out yeah. what this abstract message is that they're trying to send by doing that because, um, 
you know, it's just, I think it's an interesting topic to dig into. So do you have, uh, do you want to help me try and figure out what that message is they're trying to send and maybe um, put some perspective into it? Uh, to me personally, I, I think it's, to you're, you're breaking up. Are you, are you, me want personally, I think it's a, a I think they'll put into that a, uh, you're you're better now. Do you mind just repeating what you said? Oh, I can't. Yeah, you're back now. Sorry. Yeah, I was saying. I I think there is a, a punitive. Okay. I think there is a punitive uh, aspect to it, uh, and I I don't think that uh, Israel really needs to do that. I think the largest part of it is obviously it's a security wall, and it's worked. That's the main thing. Is that it, it's definitely done what it's meant to do. I do believe though. That there is a little bit of a punitive aspect to it, and unfortunately, uh, you know, how well do you uh, get your point across if you're Israel? Right. Um, so someone named uh, Carl, who's listening in on the conversation, asked an interesting point, and I've actually watched one video of Jimmy Carter on the uh, on the uh, you know the oppression of Palestinians. Yeah. Um, do you know he asks a pretty simple question, Carl? He says, President Jimmy Carter refers to the oppression of Palestinians on Palestinian land as apartheid. Is he anti-Semitic? I mean, what would be your response to someone like a, a figure such as the former President of the United States having this, making that conclusion? Well, for the first part of it, I, I don't really take Jimmy Carter very seriously. I think Jimmy Carter has pretty much embarrassed himself over the last couple decades, and his opinion means less than nothing. I know people tend to talk about, oh, he won the Nobel Prize. Well... I hate to break it to you, but a lot of people that didn't really deserve to win the Nobel Prize have won the Nobel Prize. So I don't think he's anti-Semitic. I just don't think he's very bright. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so what I was going to... I just wanted to say one thing. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. You uh, go. I noticed Greta, keeps, Greta Berlin keeps asking me about how I make money off the Israelis and selling weapons. I don't know where she got this uh, you know, rumor, but... I can assure her I don't sell weapons. I work at a telecom here in Calgary. I used to work in security, but I didn't sell weapons. Okay. <laughs> see, see what Vonvo. Just because I, I Von, can read this. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> see, see how Vonvo is able to, uh, you know, clarify your own uh, personal background <laughs> <laughs> to to people yeah. who have been following you. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, here's an interesting question that I've asked some of the other Palestinian individuals. Um, their answers sort of vary. Um, ultimately, where do you think, um, where do you think, you know, the, the the Palestinian people? They talk about their right to return, um, and I hear, you know, this this argument um, a bunch of times on Vonvo over the past few weeks. Um, if they want to return, um, it requires some people leaving, uh, and most likely the Jews. Although there are plenty of Palestinians that say, you know, let's. Uh, live, you know, together, um, you know, in one country. Um, I wanted to ask you, where do you think that they, what do you think ultimately um, a majority of these Palestinian uh, authorities, where are they looking for Jews to go? Um, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. I mean, they talk about their one state solution, and how they want to free Palestine from the valley to the sea. I, I think it's pretty obvious what they, what they would prefer, but it's like I always tell people. I mean, as somebody that's Métis, I've, I know what displaced people go through. And I think it's kind of humorous to me that, you know, the Palestinians seem to think that they're the only displaced people in the history of the planet to be allowed to return to where they were displaced from. I mean, if you really want to go back in history, then you look at the Jews. The Jews are now back in Israel. They were displaced thousands of years ago. Now they're back. So, I mean, the right of return to me is a non-starter. They should be compensated, and they should be compensated very well because history has shown that other displaced peoples have been compensated for their loss. But at the end of the day, you know, they're, they're probably not going to get Israel back. That's just the reality of the situation. Right now, do you think the fact that Palestinian people did used to live on those lands, and like obviously if we go into history, I'm not a history major just to throw it out there, but from talking to all these people, I'm getting a better sense of the history. You know, you hear about 1948, how... There are all these refugees displaced, and they've had to go to other areas of the world. Um, do you think That's that? Do you think that those refugees should be 
entitled to come, you know, come back to the land um, as long as they're. Oh, I mean, you, you have to look at it. Like, look at how many Jews were actually displaced from Arab lands after 1948. Uh, Israel accepted them with open arms. You don't, you don't hear about Jewish refugees. But 65 years later, we're still hearing of Palestinian refugees. Now, if you look at the Palestinian community in Chile, those are Palestinian expatriates that left. They actually pretty much run the country, and they've actually helped build that country. Now, that tells me that this is not a situation where it's just a, the Palestinians aren't smart enough or they're not dedicated enough to build something. What it tells me is that the leadership that's in Palestine hasn't been interested in building a state. Because, I mean, if you look at the Palestinians and what they've been able to do in Chile, it's pretty amazing. What, what, is, what is that you're referring to? I haven't, I've yet to hear that, if you want to elaborate on it. Oh, well, basically, uh, a lot of Chilean, Chilean uh, people that are expatriate Palestinians, like Palestinians actually have a large percentage of the government there. They have a huge expatriate community, and they're actually extremely successful. A good friend of mine actually just moved to Canada from there, and he's pretty much told me a lot about it. Great. So it's just basically, to me, it's a good example of what people can do if they're dedicated and if they're willing to work hard. Right, exactly. Um, and so uh, I, I guess we can move into, because a bunch of people are asking about it, um, sure. you know, what is, and I'm just going to look through quickly the comments, one second. Uh, opposition. What's your feeling about, I mean, Greta makes a few comments, and I've actually wanted to bring up the subject, so maybe we'll go into it. What's your sure. feelings on the role of international law in this idea of the right to return? What's your, what's your understanding of how that, um, you know, all works? Well, it's, it's really difficult, actually, uh, when we talk about international law, because you have, to, you have to factor in, you know, the inherent bias and prejudices that the UN has shown. Now, I think it's kind of humorous, too, that the same people that are talking about the UN and how you know, the UN needs to be involved and the UN needs to do this and that, these are the same people, though, that tend to ignore, uh, you know, simple facts of the situation. Like, you know, we, there's, a, there's just genocide going on in Rwanda, and they're too busy talking about Israel to say anything about Rwanda. Those right. are the kinds of things that, to me, demonstrate a bias. Now, it's funny that, you know, the UN is actually the, the original body that you know, gave legitimacy to Israel, but the same people that don't want to give legitimacy to Israel are now, you know, the UN is the, the be-all and end-all of international law. So at that point, you know, it makes it difficult. Right. Um, Rashid, are you there, sir? Now we got his camera. I can see him, I can't hear him. Right. We can't, we can't hear you, Rashid. We see you. Um, it's something. It's something with your microphone. Um, I would if you put your ma if you put your mouse over your face, there's some settings options. If you put your mouse over your screen, Rashid, there are some settings options, and uh, you can adjust your microphone there. Um, but okay, so and if you want, maybe you can type some questions into the text chat, and uh, I can ask Ryan what you're interested in bringing up right now. Okay, I don't hear him, but um, okay, no problem. Hear him. Yeah, not a big deal. Um, so ultimately, I guess I mean it, it's an interesting overall question just to ask, and obviously we're like kind of covering it, but it's good to just hear like the uh, the exact answer. What is your justification for supporting the state of Israel? Well, I don't think it really requires a justification. I think that pretty much anybody that's moral, rational, and ethical would support the state of Israel. Uh, you take a look at the genesis of Israel and how it began. Israel wasn't started by the Jews, uh, the, the modern state of Israel. Israel was actually a parcel of land that was taken aside by the British and given to the Jews in the mandate. So uh, you take a look at the amount of land in the Middle East, and then you take a look at the tiny sliver that's Israel, and you kind of have to wonder, you know, I understand that there are going to be some people there that are upset, but, I mean, at the end of the day, Israel's there to stay. And Israel's not going anywhere. So I don't feel I have to justify my support of Israel. I think it's humorous when people say, you know, you're native. Why would you support Israel? Because they're imperialist. But uh, the Jews are not imperialists. Basically, the Jews came back to the land. Right. So someone uh, named Carl uh, 
has asked a question, having heard Ryan's view of the UN, I would like to ask again if he agrees that the International Committee of the Red Cross is a credible and impartial organization. I don't, I don't think that they're completely impartial. I, I do think that uh, they are cre- they're a fairly credible organization. There are some, you know, I've, I've had some problems with some of the statements made by the Red Cross. I think sometimes they get involved in things they don't need to be involved in. But overall, I would say that the, the Red Cross is credible. I wouldn't say that it's impartial. Right. And I'm just going to type to Rashid, Rashid, what question would you like to ask? Or point would you like to bring up? Um, okay. Is he where did you? I do find it kind of interesting that Greta doesn't want to join in. She seems to have a lot of questions. Yeah, well, um, Greta has yet to join. Um, we've had Kyle on, um, and we've had, we've had multiple people, but, um, we, and we, we definitely are encouraging, uh, this type of discussion and dialogue because, I mean, ultimately if, um, I mean, we think at Vonvo, if we can, um, have these two, um, sides of the spectrum, you know, having these sorts of discussions, it will allow, you know, a more, much more objective opinion, um, and perspective to be uh, communicated to people who watch these videos than, let's say, what the news is delivering right now. Um, I mean, and just because, yeah. I mean, you seem like you have, uh, you know, you've been, you've obviously been around this conflict for a while. Maybe you want to address that. What's your take on how the media approaches this um, conflict and how they maybe uh, spark it, you know, to even greater levels or um, perhaps just ignore it? I think the media actually perpetuates this conflict about as much as anything else. Uh, you take a look, and when you look at some of the stories that have been brought up, like you know the Mohammed Al Dura and stories like that that have been so exaggerated, it just becomes the story basically takes on like a life of its own, and you end up with you know an intifada basically started because of a story that had no factual basis. Then you take a look at the fact that, in actuality, fifty thousand Palestinians have been killed since 1948. Now you need to think about that. You need to look at that number. And you need to ask, why is this so overrepresented in the media? Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, any time he's killed, obviously it's a tragedy. But my whole point would be 50,000 people since 1948, that's less people that were killed last year in Syria. Yet we hear far more about Palestine and Israel than we ever hear about Syria. Now, they're going to say, oh, well, we're not here to talk about Syria. But Syria is not the only example. There's also Libya. Libya, 35,000 people in one year killed. And it got nowhere near the amount of uh, press that this gets. And it's, I think at this point, it's almost because people think that the Palestinians are an underdog. And people love to hear the underdog story. Now, I do have sympathy for the Palestinian people. I don't, I, I don't think that the situation they're in is good for anybody, least of all them. At the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, is the media over-portraying certain things? I mean, even now, the media talks about you know, Israeli apartheid. They don't research the subject. They don't look at the subject very in depth. But I see stuff like that on the news all the time. Then when you actually look at it and examine the facts, suddenly the facts don't bear out the story. Right. Um, so I see uh, you must be a popular guy, Ryan, because people are definitely interested in hearing your opinion. Uh, you know, oh, yeah, so- they're not very big fans of me. No, but I but they're 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 interested in listening to you, and I and you know we're hopeful that maybe one day um, we can have some of you you know actually participate in a in a dialogue together. Um, but I guess what I would just ask is, um, you know, some of these people are saying you you know you're lying, you don't have any sympathy for 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 Palestinians. You know, give us tell tell these people you know tell these people what specifically uh, you do sympathize with the Palestinian people on and you know maybe we can transition that comment uh, or your response into um you know what can be made better and how can we you know begin to n- stop sympathizing with them but rather maybe you know work for, towards some solutions for them absolutely i think it's funny that they say that i don't have any sympathy for the palestinians uh they might be interested to know i mean you're on my facebook you can take a look there's actually five or six people that are palestinian on my facebook they're well aware of my opinions about the situation. Um, more importantly, unlike some of these people, I mean, you have people that are, not to name any names, but people that organize flotillas and, you know, talk all the time about, uh, you know, the Zionists. 
But I don't see those people actually making a tangible difference in the Palestinians' lives. I mean, let's be honest. If you perpetuate the conflict uh, by cons consistently demonizing one side, you're not doing anything to help them. And uh, the bottom line is, <laughs> I mean, if you really want to make a difference, there, there are definitely ways to make a difference. Unfortunately, with a lot of these people, they're, more, they're, they're far more concerned with demonizing Israel than they are about doing anything at all for the Palestinians. You can even tell by their comments. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I would love to hear, you know, some of their perspective on that. I, I see where you're coming from with, um, you know, your remarks. So, um, past that, let me just see here quickly. Sure. So, ultimately, what what's your take on, uh, you know, a solution to all this? Do you believe in a one-state solution? Do you believe in a two-state solution, do you believe in a, a unionization sort of deal? Why don't, we, why don't we transition the discussion into that? Well, I, for a little while, I thought maybe a, like a confederation or something like that might be the best way to go. Uh, more recently, I think I've started thinking more along the lines of a two-state solution. But to me, the very, the, the very crux of the matter is that there's, a, there's an unfortunate tendency on the part of the Palestinian leadership be more concerned about Israel and what they call justice than to actually get peace and prosperity for their own people. Now, even even if you look at actual example of Palestine, Palestine has infrastructure now. Palestine has started to build an economy, uh, and then unfortunately, once they started building their economy, Gaza has no economy. And if you take a look, Gaza has absolutely no interest in accepting the state of Israel. So you put those two together, and you can kind of see what's happening. Okay, great. Um, so we but I do, I do believe strongly in a two-state solution. Okay, so we can elaborate that on that in a bit. It looks like I think uh, Kyle was in our conversation last weekend. I remember seeing this uh, icon up here. Oh, there he is. Kyle, are you there? Kyle, do you hear me? Uh, everybody. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, Ryan, do you hear Kyle? I can hear him. He's yeah, a little bit quiet. Though. Hey, do you, Kyle, do you want to just speak a little bit higher into your microphone? Yeah, is this uh, is it a little better? Yeah, yeah, that's better. Um, obviously, yeah. Kyle, you 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 went through this before. Um, I want to hear. You know, we definitely want to hear uh, any responses to what Ryan's had to say. And obviously, let's just uh, be respectful uh, in our discussion. Okay, guys. Of course. Right, well, um, I'll note that you made a very important and accurate point that uh, the Palestinians have begun building infrastructure, whereas Gaza has not. But uh, I, think I don't think that was inaccurate, actually. I, I, no, that's, that's the accurate part. The inaccurate part is uh, the why. And I don't think you understand the fact that when you're under a blockade, you can't build infrastructure. And when you're getting skybombed by valiant warriors... 20,000 feet, you can't really, uh, can't really build anything up. So my question then, Kyle, the would be why are they getting bombed? Well, Is Israel just randomly they've bombing getting, them? They've been getting bombed since the early 1850s. Every couple of months, Israel comes in and just bombs the crap out of them for absolutely since no the 1950s. reason most of the time. Since the you mean the 1950s, 1950s when they were part of Egypt? No, since the early 1950s is when they weren't a quote, Jewish land. That's all it was. Even though there were there were Jews in Gaza in the 1950s. You're aware of that, right, Kyle? Some. Not very, not very many. But I mean, you're, you're, so now you're telling us that Israel is bombing Jews in Gaza? No, they weren't bombing I mean, uh, don't Jews get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely I'm here to listen. Yeah, and, and Ryan, uh, will sure just, you are. I'm sure you're Ryan, we'll just... I'm sure you're... Ryan, we'll just... Let's definitely, uh, just for the video purposes... Uh, if we go one by one in speaking, and then, you know, okay. so because if you talk over one another, the video will get all corrupted. So, Kyle, go ahead. Right. Secondly, um, you say you're in favor of a two-state solution, yet you have absolutely no problem with the wall with annexing more and more of their land. You have uh, you haven't given us any vocal position on the illegal settlements, which are illegal, that it's not up for discussion. And third, you're not interested in... <laughs> if it's not uh, up for discussion, why are we discussing it? 
response because I'm, I know you're more than willing to dispute the facts. And uh, third of all, the right of return is unalienable and undeniable. UN Resolution 194, Article 11. It was, uh, yeah, and the word is apartheid, not apartheid either, but I'm not picking you. Yeah. Um, all right. Kyle, do you do you want to let do you want to let Ryan respond to those three points you made? Yeah, probably please. not. By all means. All right, Ryan, go ahead. Well, first off, yeah, first off, uh, it's not inalienable in any way, shape, or form. So, you can you can definitely say it is. That doesn't make it so. More importantly, you're talking about how the Israelis bombed Gaza in the 1950s. Uh, <laughs> It may have happened once or twice. I mean, I, who knows? But I'm reasonably sure your whole idea of Israel contacting Gaza since 1950 seems a little bit like propaganda to me. Oh, and Article 11. Uh, so now we're going to discuss the uh, the international law. Is that where we're going now? Yeah. Go. If 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 Kyle brought it up, I, we want to hear your response, and then Kyle will go back at you know we'll uh, hear sure. what you have to say. Uh, I. I you know, they, they bring up the international law aspect of the situation with the illegal settlements, but the, the, the settlements are not illegal. The problem with the settlements isn't that, uh, like, now some of them, now here's the thing, I, that I know they're going to jump all over this. I agree that some of the settlements are immoral, and some of the settlements should not be built. But Judea and Samaria are part of Israel, and they have been part of Israel since Israel pretty much uh, did the war. So... And we've had several wars already. I mean, we can we can talk about the War of Independence, 1947, talk about the Six Day War, talk about Yom Kippur War, but all of those borders have been expanded through war. Now that anybody can argue that the Geneva Convention says you can't expand your borders through war, but Israel wasn't a signatory, I believe, of the Geneva Convention when these things happened. So, at some point, we have to decide: Is Palestine a state? As a state, are they? You know, do they get all the the, the legalities of a state? Are they allowed to? Uh, are they allowed to claim statehood before they're given statehood? Right. Yeah, and I, I think that's actually that's actually a really interesting point to uh, look into. And as soon as Kyle maybe jumps in, uh, that's something that we have yet to look at. Whether you know what they should actually be, you know, uh, labeled as, you know, because uh, Kyle, do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you just fine. Okay, so so uh, Ryan just brought up an interesting point. Um, and I, it's something that I've yet to address with anyone I think that's come on. Um, the idea behind what, you know, Palestine um, should actually be labeled as, like a state, um, you know, going forward at least, Ryan, is that what you're referring to? Like how should it be kind of encompassed as a whole? Because is the issue right now, Kyle, that with Israel, um, you know, having these occupied territories and, you know, as you say it, treating the people of Palestine very unfairly, um, is it ultimately then just a, is it a discussion about, you know, how Palestine should become its own country, its own state? What, what, how does that whole process work? Well, that process has already been handled. It's already undergone. Uh, 80% of the world's population already recognizes the state of Palestine on the 1967 borders. And, uh, that in itself, that in and of itself is already a compromise, considering that it's, a huge chunk of their territory just given away to Israel in the name of peace. They've already made those concessions. They've already made that compromise. It's a done deal. The intransigent party is the Israelis who continue their settlement program. And uh, and then just a couple days ago, Netanyahu uh, announced, what was it, 3,000 more settlements in the face of the UN vote. And he just recently said he clearly, quote, does not care, end quote what the UN thinks or what the UN states. That's not a rational actor, that's not a rational body, and that's not somebody interested in peace. Right. So how, yeah. I don't understand how you can uh, say how you can say that Israelis, oh we, we we're here for peace, but it was evil Arabs, <laughs> they're just not gonna do it. Ryan, it's, what's it's just not make it Ryan, what's your response to that? Out. What's your response to that, Ryan? Well I mean it's it's kind of that he brings up those three thousand settlement units considering they're three thousand thousand settlement units that are built in a Jewish neighborhood in East Jerusalem. So East I don't Jerusalem see what the... Jewish land. Uh, I, I beg to differ. Jerusalem is, uh, is the capital of Israel. No, Tel Aviv is the capital of Israel. East Jerusalem uh, no, I, is internationally recognized as Palestinian land. 
I'll let you know. Go ahead and finish talking. I'll I'll let you finish. Then I'll start. It's uh, are you done? Widely, it's widely recognized fact that the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem are sovereign Palestinian land. I hate to break it to you, but East Jerusalem is part of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Every nation has the right to determine its own capital. Yeah, I can't. I'm, the U.S. can't pick Ottawa as a capital as its capital. Exactly. It's in a different country. But Ottawa so is in you Canada, don't get to, and not the United exactly. States. Exactly. And Jerusalem, is, Jerusalem is in Palestine. Jerusalem is in Israel, my friend. I think you need Jerusalem to look at a map. Jerusalem is in Palestine. So I have <laughs> which map? Well, I have. So, yeah, so, I have never so, seen a map yet. 1961. I have never seen an incredible map yet that shows Jerusalem is in Palestine. So, so Kyle, question in terms of what? Because this is an, again a new. Uh, discussion uh, that's coming up that I've yet to hear um, when it comes to East versus I'm assuming West Jerusalem uh, is your are you saying that there are certain areas of that you know large city that fall within what you know uh, on the maps that you've looked at uh, as part of Palestinian lands according to international law is that what you're saying Kyle? Well Jerusalem is a divided city it's so it really shouldn't be. It's a united city. And uh, ideally, if uh, we're going to have a two-state solution, I would like to see Jerusalem as an international city, uh, shared by both, administered by both, or possibly administered by the UN, an impartial third party. Um, that's not the reality of the, on the ground. The reality is that Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, is Israeli territory, and East Jerusalem is Palestinian territory under Israeli occupation. And that's just a simple fact. Uh, Ryan, Ryan, what what do you, what do you think about uh, some of the comments that Kyle just mentioned? And um, you know, ultimately, do you see the same division in Jerusalem? Is it you know east versus west? And uh, you know, is, is that part of the issue that That's, Kyle's bringing up? Yeah. Well, there was a poll that was conducted, uh, and it was actually in a, in a paper that's not exactly pro-Israeli. Uh, Haaretz, they're a little bit famous for uh, kind of throwing things on the left side of the spectrum, but they did a poll, and in that poll, 49% of the Arabs in, in uh, East Jerusalem said that they would prefer to be uh, under Israeli governance. So at, at that point, I mean, you pretty much have to look at it as East Jerusalem's under Israeli control. There are Jewish neighborhoods in East Jerusalem, and those Jewish neighborhoods in East Jerusalem are where they're having 3,000 extra settlement blocks built. So, I mean, that, that pretty much speaks for itself. And Jerusalem is Israel's capital. Every every nation has the right to determine its own capital within its borders. Right, uh, and Canada does recognize, and I live in Canada, so Canada recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. So yeah, you can take your propaganda and take it somewhere else. Any other questions? Uh, well, I I definitely have questions. I just don't know if R Kyle. I know his video is laggy. Um, oh yeah. Kyle, do you hear? <laughs> Sorry, I just saw the, the, the question about burgers in Jerusalem. I'm not quite sure. I guess I'll try a burger in Jerusalem when I go next year. Kyle, do you uh, do you hear me or not really? He might, your camera might have frozen. Um, so well, no, I, can't I have a question. Oh, okay. Um, oh, he's back. Okay. And I just lost it. Never mind. Sorry. No, we hear you. Train of thought just fell off. <laughs> Hang on, I'll turn up my my. Um, There we go. I can't hear Kyle. Yeah, I mean, he was there, and then... Can I'm, you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you now. Do you want to repeat your question, Kyle? There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Yeah. No, I guess I got to talk right into the damn thing. Um, yeah, I had a question. I well, lost my train of thought, so carry on. Okay. Uh, if you if that question comes back, I just wrote in the text chat, Kyle, that we do hear you. Um, and if that question comes back, just let me know. Um, so here's, you know, we'll move into uh, a second subject to uh, discuss, um, and that would be the idea behind, um, you know, something that interesting that Kyle brought up, Ryan, the settlements themselves. Um, when you look at really like you know, connection now. Having a very hard time hearing most of the responses, Ryan. I get like every other word. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Is it lagging or? 
Well, his his camera's frozen. Uh, um, sometimes it's every couple of minutes or so it'll just completely lock up. Oh, I'm not too sure. Ka okay, I'm not having any issues with Max. Um, sorry, Ryan. What I was going to ask you is, you look at the settlements that are being built that Kyle just brought up, and um, you look at you know Netanyahu and his decision to go ahead and build those settlements. Um, you know, right after that whole UN resolution it stuff. Looks like I'm nice. Do you hear me, Ryan? Oh yeah. I okay. Okay. Good. Um, so what We're sort? Discussing that, yeah. 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 So what sort of message, you know, for a prime minister who's saying he wants peace, you know, what sort of message do you think he's sending when he goes ahead and you know says, oh, "Let's go ahead and build." 3,000 more uh, establishments, settlements in that area. What sort of message do you think he's sending by doing that? I think it, it's the wrong, wrong message, to be honest. A uh, really strong supporter of Netanyahu, uh, to uh, much less so. The reason being, I didn't agree with the whole way the peace in uh, this most recent little you know, debacle in Gaza. I didn't agree with the way that was done. I think that the way it was done actually sends a very bad message to Gaza, and it sends a very bad to the Israeli people themselves. Uh, when you when you put that in conjunction with this the settlements and the way it was announced, I think it kind of it sends a contradictory message. It basically says, you know, we want peace, but we're going to build anyway. And even though I don't think that all the settlements are illegal, and I do think that. Expanding Jewish neighborhoods is not a bad thing. I honestly don't think that the way it was done was a very intelligent way to do it. Kind of a problem with PR. Uh, that's one thing the Palestinians are much better at. They're much better at uh, basically getting their PR out. So, so Ryan, my my question to you quickly um, would be: so, if you're agreeing that that's not the right way to handle it, um, and it was not a good decision on their end, I mean, ultimately, do you think? A you know, and, and this kind of has its own question and its own roots. There's root problems to it as well. But do you think that if these lands, if these settlements are being built on what Kyle says are you know Palestinian lands, and there are definitely settlements that have been built you know on Palestinian lands, um, do you yep. think do you think that it's 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 an apartheid act to not allow Palestinians to live inside of these nice developments? Do you think that it's right that they're kept out? Uh, well, that, that again, not all Palestinians are kept out of the settlements. There are actually a lot of Arabs uh, identify as Palestinians. Can't really speak to that, but there are definitely a lot of Arabs that live in several of what we call the settlements. So I don't know. I don't think that that's an apartheid act at all. Right, but for the ones that are kept out, do you think that that's well, wrong? You know, yeah, you know what? There are there are some settlements that I that I personally find. Uh, and I, I know this is not a very PC thing to say, but I find them actually fairly repugnant. Uh, they're the more, more ultra-Orthodox settlements, uh, the settlements where I, I would actually even agree that they might be a little bit racist just because of the way that they deal with the people there. Now, does that mean that I'm going to demonize all of Israel for the actions of a small group of people on one settlement? No. But what it does mean is I am willing to acknowledge there are settlements in Israel that are definitely very unpleasant and they don't treat the Palestinians and I do think that should be dealt with in a very strict and stern manner. Yeah, go ahead, Kyle. Well, um, I was going to say that I'm not entirely opposed to settlements. I think the settlements are a great thing if they're being built for by Israel for the Palestinians as some as a, just a small portion of the compensation for the uh, for the treatment that they've had to endure for the past 65 years. And, uh, I do think that uh, it's very important for people to recognize that when you're living in the West Bank and you don't and you don't have an Israeli citizenship, you don't have Israeli passport or anything like that, you don't speak Hebrew, you're living under military rule. And in those military courts, you've got a 99.878, I believe, conviction rate. So it's there's there's two sets of rules. You've got, you've got the nice sunny picture of Israel, of people sitting in coffee shops in Netanya, sipping 
cappuccino and eating gelato, reading the newspaper, and everything's hunky dory. And then you've got just a few dozen miles to the east, you've got people literally going through hundreds of checkpoints, making a 15 minute trip into a four hour one. You've got people being searched, their backpack, little children's backpacks being searched for weapons or trying to go to school. It's just absolutely ridiculous the amount of disparity going on and the disparity of power in the situation and then people want to sit there and act like it's the Palestinians' fault. Palestinians never asked for the Israelis to come in. They never asked for colonizers to come in with guns, start shooting. It's, it's, it boggles the mind how people could sit there and tell me that it's incumbent upon the Palestinians to give up even more of everything that they've already lost in order for peace to have peace when you've got an Israeli prime minister who has no interest in peace whatsoever and has stated publicly in the past that they should that the Israelis should have exploited tragedies elsewhere to continue ethnic cleansing of Arabs. It's just ridiculous. So so Ryan, what's your response to Kyle's uh, a few of Kyle's points there, but the one that stuck out for me the most, um, oh shit, I might have I might have lost my train of thought. There was one thing that you said, Kyle, that that I wanted to really hear uh, Ryan's opinion on. But go ahead, Ryan. Maybe you'll just address it on its own. I I I lost my thought. Sorry. Well, you know, sure. Going from the beginning, uh, the whole idea of children's backpacks, uh, unfortunately, and and this is an unfortunate situation is that there have been suicide bombers that smuggled in bombs in a children's backpack. Because, I mean, think about it. You're a security guy, you see a family walking through, you let the little kid go, you don't even look at him. Unfortunately, if you're a good security professional, now you check everybody. I know I saw an article where they were upset that they checked a guy in a wheelchair, but we've actually found explosives in a wheelchair. So, at that point, you do have to check every single thing. Otherwise, you're remiss in doing your job. Now, when we're talking about uh, Netanyahu, and we're talking about as to whether or not he wants peace or whether or not the Israelis want peace. The Arabs had the chance several times. I mean, you look at the, at, they've refused every single offer ever given to them. That's the simple facts of the situation. You had, uh, you had the Haji, you, you had all the Palestinian leadership since, you know, the 1930s basically refuse every single offer they've ever been given. Now, I know that the excuse is, well, you know, it was all our land in the first place, but unfortunately it was never all, all their land. First it was under the yes, Ottomans, was. then it was under the British, and now it's Israel. So the, At that point, so the Ottomans, the British occupied them, that makes it not their land? That's what the are world. you talking about? These, no, that's not the way the world works. These people that's have the always the had the right to self-determination. These people have always had the right to self-determination, and it has always been denied to them. The difference is that the British, they were more benevolent in the fact that they essentially stayed out of Palestinians' day-to-day -day lives. They didn't try to run them. They didn't hurt them into settlements. They didn't hurt them into giant refugees. They didn't do anything of the sort. They basically stayed, maintained order, and let them live their lives. The difference between the British and the Israelis is that the Israelis are doing all of those things. They're killing so, them. They're Kyle, hurting them understand? into settlements. Sorry. Do you, cetera, understand cetera. That, uh, do you understand that the majority of the Palestinians that lived in the mandate didn't own the land they lived on? I mean, do you do you understand that? Is that why they had the title deeds to them? <laughs> See, that's the whole problem with this whole argument, is that you're going to bring up title deeds, but the problem is that anybody that even studies the Ottoman history... What, what are title deeds? What are census. title deeds? I've never heard of that yet. What are those? So basically, it, it's, a, it's a piece of paper that says that the land they had was theirs. But the problem is that the majority of Palestinian land was owned by absentee landowners, most of them living in the larger towns and centers. They didn't live on the land. Basically, what a lot of people don't understand is that when you're a tenant farmer, you don't own the land. You live there, you farm it for the landowner, and you pay your taxes and you pay your tithes or whatever you want to call it, but you don't actually own the land you live on. You live there, you work the land, but you don't own it. And that was the majority of the Middle East. Kyle, but what, uh, excuse That's me. That's simply not true. Yeah, Ryan, Ryan, I guess I want to, Ryan, I want to ask you a follow-up question on that, just because, I mean, maybe sure. I'm misinterpreting something, but... I mean, if someone here in the United States has a farm, and they farm that yeah. land, am I missing something? Don't they own that yeah, land? Yeah, absolutely. In the United States and in Canada, 
it's very different than it was in feudal Europe or the Ottoman Empire. In the United States or Canada, we would actually own the land usually that you farm. Now, in the United States, they had sharecroppers, and they had people that farmed the land for other people, and they were tenant farmers as well. But the majority of people in America don't understand the way that it worked in feudal Europe and in the Ottoman Empire. You, if you're a tenant farmer, you were basically a serf. And I mean, anybody that studied history understands what a serf is. That's just somebody that pretty much is a slave that works the land, and they, they're allowed to keep a portion of the crop themselves, you know, basically subsistence-level living. But a lot of people don't understand that that is the way that the, the, the entire Middle East was. The Middle East not like Canada and the United States. They weren't free people in the way that we think of free people. And that's historical fact. I mean, they could try to argue it if they like, but hist I'm pretty sure the history books will bear that out. Uh, so one, one interesting thing that Kyle brought up, I, Kyle, you mentioned it before, and now I just remember what it was that I was thinking about before. Uh, Kyle mentioned that the Palestinians haven't asked to be occupied. They haven't, they, they don't want this sort of living condition. There are plenty of good Palestinian people that have no, they, they just have no desire to be living under these conditions and being occupied. And what is your response to Kyle when he says that? Because I mean, you know, it, I think that's definitely a fact uh, because like, such as the person I spoke to earlier today, he doesn't want to be, he wants to be able to go to Jerusalem wherever he wants, whenever he wants, not every 11 years, right? Absolutely. And I think the unfortunate thing is, and, and people can argue this situation all they like, but this is the way of the world. If you're a member of an ethnicity or you're a member of a, a group that unfortunately they term it as resistance, but most of the world terms it as terrorism. If you're part of that group, even if you're not somebody that supports it at all, unless you're extremely vocal in, in basically calling it out, you're going to get painted with the same brush. And it, I, I get this thing actually quite a bit because I'm Native American. So, I mean, I, I've had people actually tell me, you know, you're pretty pale for a Native American. It's like, well, it's because I'm Métis. And immediately they, they go to the whole, oh, well, if you're Métis, then you're not really Indian. And I... I just kind of find that humorous. It's the same thing with the Palestinians. I mean, I have Palestinian friends, and they are very vocal about what they believe about Hamas. I have one friend that actually, you know, as much as it irritates me to say it, he supports Hamas. But I understand why he supports Hamas. I just don't agree with it. Now, you, going back to your question, though, the most important part of the question is, like, you know, nobody asks to be oppressed. Nobody asks to be subjugated. But unfortunately, if you're living in Palestine, and you're a Palestinian, and you are not a vocal op opponent of the regime in Palestine, you're, you're going to get painted with the same brush. Well, that's, that's just okay the way it is. What world, then that's okay in what sense of the... It's not okay. It's, it's not okay at all, but unfortunately it's the way that it is. So rather than change the way that it is, it's still okay, it's, the status quo is cool because Israelis are on top. Right. right. What's, your, what's your answer to that, Ryan? No, I'm not saying not to make changes, and I'm not saying to work on, on solutions, but the unfortunate part of the situation is, until they demonstrate a clear desire to, to basically not accept terrorism, they are going to be painted with that brush, and that's an unfortunate reality. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be working towards solutions. We definitely need to work towards solutions, but those solutions are going to have to require people renouncing terrorism, people renouncing terrorism. Pardon? Well, see, once again, you're putting the burden on the Palestinians. Sorry, I didn't hear. To put it. I'm saying, once again, you're putting the burden on the Palestinians. Can you hear me? To prove this. To yeah, prove I hear that. You have, and it's it's just completely irrational. The Palestinians don't have anything to prove. They have the legal right to protect themselves. They have the legal right to defend themselves against Israeli okay, everything's frozen. Hold, hold on, Kyle. Hold on one second. Ryan, do you hear me? Ryan, do you hear me? Kyle, wait one second, because I hear you, Kyle, but I think Ryan, uh, I think Ryan's computer might have just, you know, uh, died out. One second.
Ryan, you, uh, Kyle, you still hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, um, okay, there he goes. So hopefully I'll be able to come right back in. Uh, Kyle, let's definitely address that point because I think you're actually getting somewhere. What, what was that last point relating to, you know, it not being right? Like he's saying, you know, it's just the way that it is, but yet, like, that doesn't make it right, correct? Well, yeah, and the Israelis and the supporters of the Israelis, they have no, they have, I'll, I'll restart my statement. Right. The, um, the Israelis and the supporters of Israel, they have no genuine interest in changing the status quo. The status quo is just <laughs> fine, because Israelis are on, they've got all the, they've got all the free money flowing in. And then they can still paint themselves as the victims when it can happen. But, uh, money. The, oh, yeah. Tons of free money. Millions of... And, uh, the Palestinians don't receive aid? $50,000 compared to $8 million? Yeah. It's pretty <laughs> interesting, especially when all of that aid money is in Israeli shuffles and has to go through Israeli banks. <laughs> but, um... The interesting part is that so many people are defending the status quo because they don't have to deal with the harsh realities on the ground. They don't. The Israelis, they're fine. Like I said, the example I gave before, they can sit in the gelato cafe in Netanya and just enjoy their day-to-day -day life in a perfect world. They're not have to worry about getting blown up. Well, that's not. <laughs> Not worrying about getting blown up. American soldiers in Vietnam had to worry about getting blown up. Were they the victims? Those are soldiers. No. Those are people in a cafe drinking gelato. Doesn't matter. There's no difference. The, there's no difference. There's absolutely no. There's no difference. They're both occupiers. They're so not. I'm just curious then. You're an American and you live in America, and I'm a Native American. Mm -hmm. Am I allowed to come blow you up because you live on my occupied land? No, you're you're I mean, I'm using you're your way all all the way north. You would have to take that up with the native tribes around here. My land? No, it's not. No, it's not. It's um, exact same let's logic, just put it Kyle. This way. I'm using your logic. Kyle, you, you just no, think you're that... Not. You're not using any logic. The problem is, it's it's exactly as Robbie said before. Ireland, or the British occupied Ireland. That doesn't mean that the Ireland doesn't belong to the Irish. It's <laughs> yeah, but is Robbie sense. a pick? Is Robbie a Pict? Does he trace his lineage back to the Picts? I'm just curious because he he tends to use that argument as well, but he's not he's not well, indigenous. It's okay. That's common. It doesn't matter. It's that's not the point we're discussing. That that is absolutely the, the that, point we're discussing. You're you're just you're saying not. that they have the moral, the moral side of the story, and they're moral because they're indigenous. I'm arguing that mm -hmm. perhaps maybe they're not. But it's a settled fact that the Palestinians are indigenous. It's not a settled fact. It's actually quite disputed. It is a settled fact. It's only disputed by the people who, like you, who want to justify and excuse everything that Israel and Israelis do. <laughs> I, 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 hate, I hate to break it to you, Kyle, but uh, if you go back in history, the Palestinians, if, you're, if you want to go all the way back, the Palestinians aren't indigenous, neither are the Jews. So then it becomes who was there first. Well, people were there I mean, first really, if we're going to go with that argument. That's not. That's never been my argument. My argument is not that Israel is legit because Israel was there first. My argument is Israel is legit because Israel is there. So an is trumps an ought. Trumps an ought. Gotcha. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the way of the world. So 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 let's. So let's, you so you believe that the world operates in the law of the jungle rather than the world of man. So might makes no, right. Believe, They've got all the guns, so it's perfectly legit, right? No, that's not what I believe. What I believe, though, is that, unfortunately, the way the world works and the way we would like the world to work are two very different things. The British held the power. The British created the Palestinian mandate. The British then took most of the land away from the Palestinian mandate, away from the Jews, and gave it back to the Arabs, which obviously pissed the Jews off enough to have a revolt. But the fact of the matter is, Israel exists. That doesn't mean it always has to, or always will. But it will. But that's just not true. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it's obvious that's you guys just are not. It's not that way.
me, but that's the way it is. So, so Ryan, uh, I've stated, I've stated, I'm sorry, Max. Let me just yeah. make this one quick point. Go ahead. I've long stated I'm in favor of a one-state solution with a constitution granting, guaranteeing equal rights for all people, regardless of religion or ethnicity. Kind of like Israel was supposed to be, but um, and um, I think that the Palestinian really could live side by side in a one-state solution. If is that the possible? Israelis weren't, oh, absolutely possible. I think it would be oh, more than it'd be. I, I I do believe it's possible because uh, they've lived side by side in the past. They live just they live just fine together. The only problem they live just is fine together as long as the Muslims were in charge, correct? Racist. No, but I, I'm no, not being racist. The I'm Jews were always a, the Jews the were Muslims always were in a power. Statistical minority. But the but Muslims, the Muslims were in power, or the Christians correct? were in power. It doesn't matter. No, it, it, it actually absolutely does matter. If you actually study no, religion, doesn't. you would understand I that Muslims do not have a Muslim in a position of authority over them. So how then would there be any Jewish leadership in this so-called confederation or single state? Well, how is that possible? Proportional based on, it would be proportional based on the population. Jews but are a Muslim third. is not allowed to have in a Jew over order. in a position of authority over him. That's part of your religion. You should know that. Well, then they wouldn't live there. So they then how would there be a single-state solution? But then how would there be a single-state solution? See, That's my question, Kyle. I'm, I'm, I'm really struggling to Ryan, understand you. Ryan, let, let, let Kyle yeah. try and clarify what he's saying, and then you'll, we'll hear your response, because I think you guys are uh, you know, going into interesting territory, and um, I, I want to you know, move the conversation into solutions. So go ahead, Kyle. Say, clarify it once again. The, um, the government would have to be calculated based on population, of course. So think about it, with the Palestinian refugees and the Israeli population as it is today, taking religion out of the picture altogether, the Israelis would be third in pecking order because there are 15 million Palestinian or Arab Christians in the region, I believe, whereas there are slightly fewer than 12 million uh, Jews in the world? Am, am I, am I, does that sound about right? Fairly close. And re roughly. So assuming that, that that's how the, uh, assuming that's how it would go, it's exactly as Robbie just said in the text chat, proportional representation. Now you look at a country like Iran, which has disproportionate populational representation for Jews, which is in a constitutionally guaranteed parliamentary represent, uh, representation in parliament. Um, the single state of Palestine could have a kind of, like I said, it would have a constitution granting equal rights for all. It could have a, uh, I'm, I'm, this is obviously very flexible, it's just my idea, but it could have uh, internationals, watchdogs, NGOs, etc., etc., ensuring that just laws are being created and they're being enforced properly, etc., etc. It's the problem that the biggest problem that I'm seeing to peace today, not Hamas, just it's not Hamas, it's not rockets, it's not Israel is defending themselves. The problem is the settlements that is the most provo provocative and in. It, it, it's a very uncooperative thing to do, and I know you agree that the settlements, you, you don't necessarily agree that the settlements in and of themselves are wrong, but they are illegal, in the simple fact that um, the West Bank is not Israeli territory, and you do not have a right to transfer your civilian population into occupied territory. So, um, Okay. Honestly, so, the, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I was going to say there's lots of lots of uh, points there to go over. That's so I just didn't want to go too far before I had lost my train of thought. So first off, the, the whole idea of a single state solution uh, based on population. So what we've already determined that democracy in the Middle East is a is a very uh, interesting animal, so to speak. Uh, one man, one vote doesn't seem to work very well there because unfortunately, once you get one man, one vote. Uh, with a Muslim majority, 
they will start instituting stuff like Sharia law, basic Muslim government, because Islam is as well as religious ideology. Now, my big, my big thing, and I've had this discussion with a lot of my Muslim friends, is that if you cannot allow a, a non-Muslim in a position of authority over you, how then do you have any sort of confederation or single state? Because, unfortunately, as soon as you have that, if you institute actual Muslim rule, you cannot have a Muslim rule when you have Jews or Christians in a position of authority over Muslims. It's religiously incompatible. Now, you can say you don't want to bring religion into it, but unfortunately, religion is probably the central part of this entire conflict. So unfortunately, I, I, like, I don't see the way that you're... Uh, like, I, I, I can see that you want to have a single state. I just don't see a way that it'll actually work. Well, the thing you're missing is that you're assuming that Christians or Jews would be in charge, and they wouldn't. It wouldn't be a religious thing. It would be a demographic, it would be a population thing, it would be a nationality thing. Palestinians yeah. outnumber the Israelis, regardless of whether they're Christian, Jewish, or Muslim Palestinians. They outnumber them. So then do you, they already sorry. outnumber them, even in Israel and in the occupied territories. So, so then do you think Israel would be at all inclined towards going towards a single state? Why would anybody that lived in Israel currently want to have a, a single state? Well, it depends. Do they want peace or do they want domination? That's a very, well, that's see, a very important and distinct thing that they have to make. Well, there, there has but to I be think, an equitable peace. There has to be a just peace. And peace what is you're not, not going to come at, from the Israelis' current uh, track and their current uh, path. Well, then I would, just I would argue that, that uh, if that I was in Israel, I wouldn't want your peace. I, I would argue fine. that very strongly. I, I wouldn't want a peace where I would have to suddenly become a minority in my own country. And as much as well, you don't like to admit it, Israel is a country. Um, now, congratulations, Ryan. Now you know how the Palestinians feel. They didn't want to become a minority in their own country, but the Jews came in anyway. And they came in with a lot of guns. So now you're imposing a different set of morality, morals on Israelis versus Palestinians. It's two sets of rules. <laughs> Not at all. What I'm, what I'm actually asking, Kyle, and it, it's a very clear question, why would any that's in Israel currently accept your version of a single-state solution then? What would be the upside for somebody in Israel? They would be able to live in a peaceful country, finally. The, the conflict would be over. The war would be over. So, ah, so they'd, they'd be in a peaceful country under somebody mm -hmm. else's domination, where currently they live in the only democratic state in the Middle East. Only democratic state if you're a Jew? I don't think that they would want peace at that cost. So... so Actually, that's not true. There are Arab Israelis, members of the Knesset. So you're acknowledging that you Israelis don't, that. don't want peace. So you're acknowledging that Israelis don't want peace. No, what I'm saying is have to be under the domination of Muslims, so, which so, I think so, is a fair play. I, I, I have See, a, you're, you continue bringing up religion, and it's not a religious problem at all. It's completely a religious thing. It's not. How is this the not a religious situation, religion, Kyle? The only time religion gets brought up is when people want to excuse Israeli crimes. They use religion as a really? shield. Yes, absolutely. You criticize Israel, Not you're attacking moment, the Jews. You criticize Israeli attacks, you're criticizing the Jews. It's it's a shield. It's a trick. And how How is it a shield or a trick it? to say that there's one religion in the Middle East that is predominant, and that religion has an ideological component? How is that anything like a shield or, or a misplay. I'm not trying to trick anybody. This is all stuff you can... You, I mean, you're a recent convert to Islam. I'm sure you've discussed it with your religious leader. You cannot have a non-Muslim in a position of authority over you. That's part of your religion. I do. Yeah, unfortunately, because you live in the United States, correct? Mm -hmm. we, we both have... We have a mutual friend who is a Muslim who left the United States because he's a legalist Muslim and he believes very strongly in his religion. He had to move somewhere where he would no longer have non-Muslims in positions of authority over him. Well, that's also I'm not a, uh, to... yeah. that's a that's a sticking point. That's that's one of that's something that a lot of people take very seriously, and a lot of and something that other people are more willing to compromise on in the in the pursuit of peace. 
And um, I know for myself, if I had that choice, I would most de- I would live under anybody's rule if it guaranteed equal rights, peace, and the opportunity to prosper. The yeah. is, <laughs> Palestinians are being denied even that choice. They're not, they're not even given a choice. Who, they're guilty from birth. Do Do either of you want to just quickly mention who? Uh, you know, because you, Ryan said you guys have a uh, a friend who um, has went through similar. Um, you know, I guess he's maybe somewhere in the middle of both of you. But can you just kind of go over? Just because I'd rather not. I'd rather uh, not name drop. And all right. No, no, but can, no, no, no. Don't, don't, don't name drop. But can you can you describe what that person? You know, is there a story that that person has of this entire situation that people should know about how he's had to live like his life? You don't have to name drop. I'm saying like, what's the actual? you know, premise behind what he's had to go through. Well, what I'll do, Max, uh, he's actually a really good friend of mine. I think he might even be interested in something like this, but he's a, the easiest way to explain it is he's a good friend of mine. He's a, he's a convert to Islam, but he's a, a fairly legalist Muslim, which means that he has very, very strong beliefs and he actually follows the book to the letter. Um, now I, I don't think he'd have a problem being on here and explaining his beliefs himself. I think that probably would work a lot better. Uh, right, because I don't think I can do justice to yeah, what yeah, he honestly course. believes. Of course, of course. But I mean, I, I'll definitely come quite either. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely invite him. Cool. Um. So here's uh, I guess one one interesting thing that I would throw out there, Kyle. We never brought this up to you. Um. And Ryan sort of mentioned it before. You've got uh a minority population of Jewish people. I think Ryan said that, or you said it was twelve million in total throughout the whole world. Right. Um, wh- where do you know? Do 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 the Palestinian people, um, or do you think the world, um, you know, those who are in opposition of what goes on in Israel, do you think that they have a preferred place that they should be allowed to live? Because you know, you you look at that region, and there are a bunch of countries, obviously within the Middle East, that have you know Muslim uh, roots and Islamic, um, you know. Uh, you know, roots that have, you know, that have um, established those countries. Um, And, you know, you have this one Jewish state, which is a small slice of land, a small number of people. Where do you think, um, you know, these people should be living? Are they entitled to their own country? What's your thoughts on that, Kyle? Well, I'm opposed to the current incarnation of the, quote, Jewish state, because I think the very concept and idea in and of itself is racist and disgusting. There is no moral or legal justification for coming in, claiming history that's made up history, of course, to come in and use violence to force the indigenous people off their land and claim it for your own. The World Zionist Council rejected both Kenya and Argentina as possible sites for the Jewish homeland. And I'm using homeland in cheek because it's really not a homeland, it's just a base of operations, I guess you could say. And um, of course, all people are entitled to the right of self determination, that's an un- unalienable human right. No, there's no way to deny that. Uh, but the difference is how you go about it. The, the Jewish people wanted a homeland, a, the Zionist movement started in the 1880s, 1890s. And it was French. Most Jews rejected it. They were like, these guys are absolutely crazy. Forget about it. The world, then World War II happened, and a lot of really bad things happened to a lot of really, a lot of really undeserving people. So, international sympathy was automatically on the Jewish people's side. And when the uh, World Zionist Council settled on Palestine, immigration, it, it had been fairly steady. But it was still pretty slow. Then after World War II, immigration came in very heavily, and so did the radical element. And with that radical element came a whole lot of terrorism, a lot of ethnic cleansing, and over 500 villages wiped off the map, and you never hear about that in the West. You never hear about it, because it doesn't fit the narrative of the poor and Jews had no choice but to defend themselves. I would argue that we hear about story. it quite often. No, you never hear about it, ever. Unless you do <laughs> autodidact, unless you do autodidactic research and try to research the history yourself, 
you will never see Bill O'Reilly or Lawrence O'Donnell or any of these people. You will never see them mentioned. Well, I don't call. I don't consider that news. <laughs> well, n- no, but the average Joe does, and that's who we're attempting to speak to. I think you know a wide range, a, a vast audience. Correct. Well, fair enough. Go ahead, Ryan. I uh, see. Here's the thing, and I I think a large part of the situation here when we get into these arguments, and I do consider them to be more or less arguments. Uh, people tend to ignore the fact that it is it is two sides to every story. And don't get me wrong, I'm definitely not going to marginalize the Palestinian situation. It's a bad situation. But by the same token, I don't really appreciate when people try to exaggerate it. And that's why I don't like to hear terms like genocide and Holocaust being thrown around, because I think that 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 basically marginalizes actual Holocausts and genocides. What we need to do is we need to discuss it openly and honestly. But at the end of the day, we also have to acknowledge that there are certain facts about this conflict that maybe don't fit either narrative. And I, I think that, that tends to, to get lost. Right, and, and it, what's the way to, to fix that, Ryan? I think things like this. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I think this is a good uh, a good thing. You get people in and talking about things. I mean, you're... Oh, sure. oh, just at the time I wanted to hear him. Ryan Charles. <laughs> right? He was... Uh, Ryan, do you hear me? Or no? No, it might have, uh, let me see here. It kind of seems as if we might have been uh, wrapping up as well. Ryan, if you want to leave and come back. Topic of conversation. What's up, guys? <laughs> hey, hey, how's it going? Are we on? 